Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I don't know about you, but uh, I have much to be thankful for this morning and looking forward to singing uh, praises to our God. 22 years ago today, Rosanna and I stood in a little church up in Napa County with our friends and family and uh, were married. And so I'm thankful for that this morning. Since then, the God has blessed us with a, with a wonderful family and a church family as well. So join with us in singing number seven, uh, The Lord in Zion Reigneth. song this morning will be hymn number 573. I'll go where you want me to go. Please stand.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'd like to personally welcome each one of you, especially our guests, our first-time visitors, and also those who are watching us online. You know, today I was um, having lunch, and I was coming out of a, a restaurant, and this lady in the car says, excuse me, like, don't you sing for your church? And then I was like, See, yes, like, which church? She's like, the Seventh-day Adventist church. I was like, yes, like, how do you know? She said, I see you online singing at church. So, and I guess they were a former pastor here and his wife. So, you know, I know that our AV crew does a lot of work and a good job um, uh, posting our, 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 our services online. And so, you know, it just makes me feel good that People are out there watching and joining and worshiping with us. Um, as we start, I do have some announcements. Today, after church, uh, as you can see, we, we do have our potlucks, so we'd like to welcome every one of you to join us to have fellowship together. Uh, if it's your first time here, you just go right down uh, below our church. There is a cafeteria, so we'd like to welcome you. And then... Uh, this week, uh, PAS, our Adventist local school, is starting. So if you guys are interested, we do have registration that is open, I believe, Monday through Wednesdays from 10 to 12 and 5 to 7. And they will actually be having, I believe, like an open house for us to meet the teachers. that will be available on Tuesday, 5 to 7 p.m. And also tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, on Tuesday night, it's our, um, our monthly church board meeting at 6 p.m. And we are, just a reminder, every Thursday nights we are still having our prayer meeting. And on Thursday, 7 to 8 p.m., we are having our Let's Preach seminar via Zoom. I believe it was started uh, this past Thursday. The information's on the screen. You could go to our website or, um, or ask Bogdan or Pastor if you have any questions regarding that. Um, let's see. And we also have, looks like, a Silicon Valley mission trip from August 30th, September 4th. I believe they're going out to San Jose door to door, passing out great controversy. So if any of you guys could join, that would be great. And um, before we do our prayer song, I do have a few prayer requests. Uh, first prayer request is from Julie Gerhardt and uh, Nicole Baby Jamie. She uh, was premature, so we would like to keep them in our prayers. We have a few unspoken prayer requests. We also have a prayer request for Jerio Ozeda as she I believe she is starting her, uh, her university, and so they're driving to Texas tomorrow, so we'll pray for their safe travels. We'd like to continue to pray for Arlen Fox, for him to recover and to be home, uh, back home soon. We also have a request for Doreen. Um, her sister Dorothy and Loma Linda had recently passed away, so we'll definitely keep them in our prayers. Um, we also want to pray for uh, Linda's friend, uh, Stacy, Kathy, and Jane. They're all having some health issues, so let's pray for them. And we also want to pray for a Gill family. Um, I guess a family member, Eunice, has passed away. And we also want to pray for Avril, who is also having health issues. And we will also have a, um, a prayer request for Garcia's family. And a prayer for Jimmy and John, who's uh, asking for some divine comfort. So before we pray, let's sing our prayer song, and if possible, kneel together and have our opening prayer. Throne where grace. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for calling us um, to this wonderful um, church that we're here to worship you. And as we continue our worship service, I ask that you will be with us and we invite you and accept our worship service. And thank you for blessing us and guiding us through this past week and how you have protected us, kept us safe. We also ask that you will forgive us of the sins that we have committed, the sins that we have in our heart, that we'll come to you with a clean heart and that our heart will be prepared to receive your word. We have a lot of prayer requests that we'd like to lift up this morning. We would like to pray for Julie's family, for their uh, baby, that you'll be with the baby, help the baby to recover, to be healthy and to be able to be united and to be back home with the family. We also pray for Jerry as their family travels down to Texas, that you'll give them um, safe travels and that she starts school, that you will be with her, um, that you will guide her in all the things that you do. We also pray for Arlen Fox as he recovers, that, that you'll be with him, that he'll, they'll have a speedy recovery, they'll be able to come back home and be also join his family again. Uh, we pray for Doreen's family and for the Gill family who've lost their family members. And it's not easy to lose your loved ones. And I ask that at this time that you draw near to them, comfort them and help them to be comforted and knowing that even though they may not be with us here, but we know that it is not a forever goodbye, but we will be united again at your second coming. Um, we also pray for uh, Linda's friends and uh, for those who are suffering through for medical and health issues. You have created us and you know our body and you know all the needs, uh, the physical needs that we have. Please be with those who are not feeling good, help them to recover, and that they'll be able to experience good health again and to glorify your name through that. And we also pray for uh, Garcia's family. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going on, but I ask that whatever the needs they have, that you will draw near to them, and that you will um, help them through their difficult times. And we also pray for Jimmy and John as they're perhaps looking for things and answers in life, but that you will also be with them, send your angels down upon them, and help them to realize that you are always, always in charge, and that you will know what is best for all of us. We also continue to pray for this church, um, help us to be a blessing to others, and as pastor brings your message, Please open our ears and open our hearts that we will receive your word and by that word we'll be transformed and to be like you. Again, thank you for all the love that you have for us. And please bless us today on this Sabbath day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good. 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 Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Are you guys doing well today? Yeah. Let me hear. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good job. I'm going to need your help today here. Let's uh, make two groups. Like uh, from here to here. I'm going to give you this board. Come on here. Come on. Come forward. And this group here. Okay? Come this way. Okay. You two guys, I need you here. You and you. Okay. You help. Now we have here this wooden blocks. Okay? Okay. They're Jenga's. So I want you to build a house. You build it here. And you build it here. Over, come on, let's build a house together. Quick, 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 quick. quick. Okay. Okay, let's go. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, so you're the big guys. These are the little guys. Come on, let's build a house. Let me see how you build together. Quick, quick, quick. Quick, quick, quick. Okay. Quick, quick, quick. There it goes. There it goes. Okay, just put a couple of walls. And, and okay. Like, okay, put them on top, put them on top. Another one, and, and where are the walls? Where's the roof? Okay, help them out, build a house. Okay, is that a house? Come on, I want to see a house. I, see, I want to see two walls, I want to see a roof. Okay. This is not coming out as I expected. <laughs> All right, guys, okay. So, where's the house? One wall, another wall, another wall. Okay, so build a house. Okay, so here's a house, and then we put a roof, and we put something like this, and here's a house. Okay, let's do that. All right, so here's a house, and now you can build a fence around. Okay? Is that a house? It doesn't look like a house. I want you to stand and put him stand. Okay, we're having too much time here now. Okay, so, okay, time's up, time's up. Okay, can you go back to your seats? All right, good job, good job, good job. Now I want you to look at this. I don't know if you call this a house. It's, it's I don't know where it is. Tell me something. What is it easy to build on this, like a standing house? Why not? It was so cushiony. It's cushiony. And what happens if we just shake it a little bit? Like, oh, it fell apart. Oh, look at the little kids. They built such a big house there. Why? No, it's not because they took all the blocks. Look at this. If I shake it, you know what happens here? I'm shaking it. It's not, it's not falling. No, I'm shaking it real hard, but it's not moving. You know what happens here? Let me tell you something. And this is the, a true story from the Bible in Matthew 7. Jesus was teaching the people and he was telling them that there is two ways that we can grow in faith or not. Jesus says, if you hear what I teach you, and you do what I say to you, it's like building a house on a rock. Things will happen, and different difficulties will come, and they will shake you, but the house will never fall. But if you build a house on a cushiony, sandy place, it's like people who listen to Jesus, but don't do what Jesus said. And then what happens to your faith? When something happens to you, and it shakes you a little bit, and it falls apart. So what we we'll learn today is that whenever we hear and we learn from Jesus, we also have to do what Jesus says. And in that way, our faith is going to be strong and will never be shaken. Do we agree on that? All right, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, help us all to be wise as the person who built on the rock. Help us to hear your word and to do it according to your will. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go back to your seats.
Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Um, please turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. And it reads, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. May the scripture reading bless our hearts today. Good morning. We're glad you're here today. Today I want to talk about the exception to the rule. Jesus gave us a warning about the end of time. He said, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, that that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come upon it will come as a snare upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. The day he's talking about is the second coming. We are told there will be some that say to the rocks and the mountains, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for great is the day of his wrath has come, and who will be able to stand? It isn't because they didn't know, or they weren't told, but because they got overwhelmed, or distracted, or busy with other priorities, or they just failed to prepare. You see, focus is really important to all professional photographers. They understand this concept. Depending on what you focus on, depends on what you see. If you change the focus on your camera, you will see the fence before the cheetah. And you won't see the beautiful animal. It's not trick photography. It's just changing the focus so that you can see the fence instead of the animal. If you change the focus again, the fence disappears. If I can get within four feet of any fence or cage that an animal is in, and the animal is about eight feet away, with my camera, I can focus out that fence. It's important in life to stay focused that Jesus is coming again. Amen? Amen. So today I want to talk about the exception to the rule. Because you can get gobbled up by events that happen in your life. Things that are unexpected, that take place, and it kind of throws you for a loop. You can get thrown and gobbled up by policies that others put in place, and you can't understand why those policies affect you, because you didn't make them, and yet there's events that transpire that cause things to be the way they are, and we wonder why. You can get gobbled up by the habits that you get caught up with. You choose to believe a certain way or a certain thing or react a certain way. You know, I love the book that I read that talks about the success secrets by the man that wrote the book. If you remember the book called Chicken Soup for the Soul. Anybody ever hear of that? And what he says is that you can't control the events that happen in your life. But you can control how you react to them. So the events plus your reaction equals the outcome. Not just the event. We don't want to get gobbled up by any of them. And so today I want to talk about the exception to the rule. Here's the outline that I'm going to follow today. I'm going to introduce the biblical concept of being the exception to the rule. And then we're going to talk about Jesus 
and a short passage in the Bible that talks about what he did because it gives us clear insights as to how we should respond and react. And then what can we learn from that story? And then we'll summarize it and I'll make my appeal. So we'll start with the biblical concept of being the exception to the rule. There's all kinds of illustrations I could use, but I've just picked out a few. He should have been eaten by the lions, for that is what usually happened. And that would have been the accepted norm. When you get in the cage with the lions and they come around you, normally they eat you up. But that didn't happen to him. He truly was the exception to the rule. Then there's those three boys that were thrown into the fiery furnace all tied up because they wouldn't bow down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Everyone else bowed down because it was the accepted norm. But these three young men risk everything when they stood up for what they believed in. And there were rich rewards and they truly were the exception to the rule. Because when they called them out of the fire, it says they didn't find any signs of being singed. No hair on their head was even singed by the heat of the flame. They didn't smell like smoke. Sometimes when you get around a fire or a fireplace or someone that's been smoking, you smell like smoke. But the Bible says they didn't even smell like smoke and none of the hair was singed. They were the exception to the rule. And then, of course, there's Enoch. The Bible says he was the seventh from Adam. The Bible says he walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Some searched for him and they couldn't find him. He was the exception to the rule. That isn't what normally takes place with people. And then we've got Queen Esther. Many times those in positions of power pass laws to restrict the rights of others. Esther worked to defend the rights and liberties of others. She also was the exception to the rule. And then there's David standing there to facing Goliath. For 40 days and 40 nights, this monster bellowed his challenge to the armies of Israel. And the only response that he got was to watch them run and hide. All of Israel's lined up for battle. It says morning and evening they dress for battle. They put on their helmets. They put on their coat of mail. They got their weapons and they stood there ready to fight. And when Goliath strode out and bellowed at them, it says they all forsook and fled. The only response he got was to watch them run and hide. That is until David came along. He was the exception to the rule. We all know how that one ended. And then there was Elijah. The norm was to grow older and die. How many know that's true? When you get older, you get weaker, have more aches and pains. I know. <laughs> but instead of following the accepted norm, God sent a fiery chariot to pick him up and bring him home. He was truly the exception to the rule. Yes, these are all biblical examples, but there have been others that have been the accepted exception to the rule. Those have refused to be limited by the accepted norms of their time. And we could talk about different ones who did not accept certain things in their culture. And they developed things that people said couldn't be done. We could talk about the automobile line and assembly line. We could talk about the phone. We talked about all the great inventions. There were many. So I asked the question today, how do you get to be included in that group? Does the Bible say? Does it give us insights? Does it tell us what to do and what not to do? How do you get it? How many here... When you pray, you want your prayers to be answered. Anybody? Yeah. When you ask God for healing, you want to be healed. Anybody? Yeah. We want to be the exception to the rule. Whether it's among Christians or whether it's among non-Christians, the exception to the rule. 
How do you get to be included in that group is with Jesus. The Bible says, of course, that he was the exception to the rule. Fran uh, James Francis puts it this way in his poem called One Solitary Life. Here's a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside of a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials except himself. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen long centuries have come and gone. Today, he is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. Today we're talk about the, accepted, the exception to the rule. So let's look at Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, He is the author and finisher of our faith. So let's look at Jesus today and see what we can learn. As He went up to the feast. Here's the quote from John chapter 7 verses 1 to 5. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here, go into Judea, that your disciples may also see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then verse 6 through 10. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. It's a small passage about a detail in Jesus' life that we don't give a lot of thought to. What can we learn from this story? What does it tell us? Does it tell us what is involved with being the exception to the rule? I think it gives us some hints in that direction. There are three things that are pointed out and become specific in this particular story. Timing is an issue. Exercising the power of choice that you have from God is an issue. And keeping the end goal in mind. Let's look at timing for a moment. Is it important timing when you do certain things, being in the right place at the right time? I have mentioned stories in my own personal experience. There was a day when I bought a little black box, if you remember. And in that box were 33 bungee cords. And I set it up here and opened it during my sermon. And I mentioned to you one day that I happened to be going to Home Depot and I was walking in and one of the things I was going to be looking for was a bungee cord because I needed a couple bungee cords. And as I was walking in, I noticed this large box 
sitting just inside the door. And as I walked past, someone had scribbled on the side, free. And I looked in and there's bungee cords, piles of bungee cords. And I thought, are you kidding me? Sitting right here in front of my face when I walk into the store. And so I turned to the clerk and I asked him, is this true? He says, I don't know. Ask him. So I went over and I asked him. He says, yeah, we're trying to get rid of them. Okay. So I went over and pushed my cart right next to the box and I started piling them in and piling them in. And I left and I said, oh, I need more. I went back and piled them in. I ended up getting home with 33 bungee cords. Doesn't it say somewhere that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or even think? I did not write on my list 33 bungee cords today and let's make the price free. How important is it to be in the right place at the right time? How many have experienced that blessing in your life? Anyone? Yeah. What a blessing it is. I could tell story after story after story where I've been in the right place at exactly the right time. And I think, wow, somebody has coordinated these events in my life. That's phenomenal. I wish every day that happened. But sadly, it doesn't. How important is it to be in the right place at the right time? Jesus talks a lot about timing. When David chose, was, was David chosen to go to war against the Philistines? No. Or did he just happen to be at the battlefield when Goliath appeared? Down through history, many individuals refer to this story whenever they want to illustrate someone being victorious over any insurmountable obstacles. And this is remembered. I hear people in all different walks of life. Oh, David and Goliath is this story because you overcame great obstacles. If you recall the details of the story, David was on the battlefield on an unrelated matter. He was bringing supplies to his brothers because his father asked him to. Not of his own choosing. When this happened, David was not asked to go to war, but was forgotten by his family, assigned a mundane task of watching the sheep while others strutted their stuff on the battlefield until Goliath appeared. And the Bible says when David walked up, Goliath came out and he bellowed his challenge that he'd been doing for 40 days and 40 nights. And David looked around was waiting for someone to charge this guy. And the Bible says all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Well, that's another story. But David was in the right place at the right time. Timing is an issue. Is it possible there was an unseen hand guiding the circumstances and the lives of many individuals to bring about this story that so many remember and so many quote? David became the exception to the rule because he was ready to be used by God. Amen? In the story of Esther, Esther just happens to be chosen out of many maids. And she wonders about that. And Mordecai counsels her and says to her, Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Timing is important. How do you get to be included in this group? Let's look at what happened with Jesus and what went place and how important it is to be in the right place at the right time. The Bible says, Jesus said to them when his brothers told him, Oh, go up to the feast. Do it in a public manner. You need to show people your stuff because you can do all these miracles. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. He was on God's timetable. He said, I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. He was conscious of God's timing and leading in his life. Most people desperately want this blessing of timing to be in their life. I want to be in the right place at the right time. I see commercials on TV sometimes where somebody's standing in line and they're in line and there's four or five people and as they advance in line, 
somebody has one item and they step up and he's, oh, go ahead. And the guy that steps up happens to be the 852nd customer and the bells and whistles go off and he gets the prize and that's where the guy in line says, oh man, I missed that one. People want that one desperately. Timing. This blessing, though, does not stand alone in this story, but has two other factors connected to it. And sometimes we miss that. We think, oh, I need that blessing, but we don't look at the details of the story and the other two factors that are connected. Number one is exercising your choice. That's important. If you want to be in the right place at the right time, you have to exercise your choice. Notice how this is illustrated twice in this short story. It must be important. It's illustrated twice. It happens two times. Let's look at it. When circumstances are unfavorable, Jesus makes a choice to remove himself and not be there. What does the Bible say? After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. His brother said, go to Judea and show yourself. And Jesus says, I don't want to go there. I'm choosing with my choice because things are unfavorable over there right now. And I'm aware of that. I'm going to go someplace else. That wasn't what his brothers told him. But he made that choice. And then secondly, Jesus makes a choice to go to the feast without his brother's company. Well, that's kind of a different slant on things. Jesus said to them when they said, go, we're going to the feast, come with us, uh, go right now, show your stuff. And Jesus said, my time has not yet come. He made a choice to not associate with them and go with them. And he says, I am not yet going to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Now he makes this big statement about timing, and then notice the details when he said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. He made the choice not to go with them, not to be included in that group, not to have them in his presence, so to speak. But then it says, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast. You see, sometimes we have to make choices about what we're going to do, and we have to exclude ourselves from certain things. You know, if a young person is in a group of people that get into the wrong activity, how many parents think it's a good idea that they make a choice and exclude themselves from that company? Anybody here? That would be wise counsel. According to the Bible, that's what Jesus did. He says, hey, I'm not going with those guys. I'm not going to walk with them because I'm going to be influenced by them. Doesn't say all that, but he does exclude himself. When his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast. Why would Jesus do this? The Bible says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditates day and night, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And then I can't read the last words. It must be too far away. It's fuzzy for me. Help me out here. Someone read it together. The last line there. What does it say? Yeah, isn't that cool? You know, they've got a commercial I hear on TV called the Midas Man. He goes around and he touches things and they turn to gold. Somebody's invention for a commercial. But isn't that what it's saying? What you do will prosper? How many want that to happen in your life? That means you would be the exception to the rule. Because that's not the norm. That's what we're talking about today. And part of the blessing that's talked about in the Psalms here says that you exclude yourself from things that would lead you astray or that would discourage you. The company that you keep, the books that you read, the things that you watch, does it make a difference? Yeah, apparently it does. Jesus gives us the example. And then if we were to go into another story, are there other stories that say the same thing? Yeah. When Jairus' daughter was resurrected, if you read that story in Mark 5, verse 37, 
When Jesus takes off, it says he did not allow anyone else to go with him except Peter, James, and John. So Jesus is saying, don't follow me, except for these guys, the exception to the rule. They get to follow. Why? Maybe they would have been saying, well, I'm not sure this can happen. I can't do anything about it. You can't help. And then verse 40. When you study that story about Jairus' daughter being resurrected, Jesus arrives on the scene of action, and there's mourners wailing, the Bible says. And then Jesus said, she's not dead. You can't see it in the English. It says they ridiculed him. But the Greek says they laughed him to scorn. They knew the girl was dead. And what happened? Did Jesus say, oh, let's all crowd in and watch what I'm going to do? No. It says when he put them all out, he excluded them from his presence when he went in. And the power of God was going to be displayed through him. Powerful story. We're talking about being the exception to the rule today and what it takes to get there. How do you get to be included in that group? The other one, in the story with Jesus, the third point, besides the timing and exercising your choices that may lead you to be in the wrong company, the wrong reading material, the wrong place, the third is keeping the end goal in mind. What is your purpose that God has for you in this life? Here's the, here's the verse that we're studying in the story about Jesus. It says, for he did not want to walk in Judea. He made that choice. Now the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. And his brothers say, you, you should go. Everyone will see what you're doing. If you do these things, show them. But they didn't believe in him. Then Jesus said, my time has not yet come. Your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because of what? I can't read what it says. What does it say? I testify that its works are evil. Is it possible that your purpose from God is to testify to his power, his presence in your life, and that some of the things going on in this world are not what God designs. Carl was teaching the Sabbath school lesson. I wish all of you could have been here for it. Talking about the suffering and how we live with the suffering and tolerate it and understand it. I think there's many people out there that are going through difficult times right now with some of the things that are happening and the high prices and inflation and all that kind of stuff and they could try and understand that more if someone spoke a word to them to help them understand and keep the end goal in mind Jesus is coming again amen Jesus said the world hates me because I testify that its works are evil we have to keep the end game in mind when we pass through some of these things, the difficult times that there is hope in the future. There's hope beyond the grave. I had the sad privilege of talking and comforting the family. Maybe many of you know Eunice Gill, the Pakistanian man that has attended here for years now. He died this last week. He went into the hospital for a simple operation on his knee they gave him blood thinners, and the blood rushed to his head and killed him. He was a vegetable. I got a phone call. His wife and daughter attended church a while ago also with him, and I had to comfort them and talk with them about that. Unexpected, but he believed in Jesus, and I praise the Lord for that because we don't know when that end day will come. It was a simple operation. It shouldn't have been a problem, but it was, and now he is no more. Summary and appeal. If you want to be the exception to the rule, then ask yourself these questions. Do you really want to receive God's blessing of being in the right place in the right time? How many want that blessing in your life? Okay. God can coordinate the activities of your life. If you doubt that, we need to read what the Bible says more because God says you can be in the right place at the right time and he can coordinate that. Are you willing to do what it takes to get there? You have to make choices in your life in order to get there. Are you willing to exercise your choice to place restrictions on yourself 
so that you might receive his blessings. Sometimes people think I can do anything and I still want to be blessed by God. I've had people come to me when I was doing evangelistic meetings and say, Pastor, I hear that you anoint people and they get well. I do anoint people freely. I had one lady come to me during meetings. She smelled like tobacco. She reeked of it. She says, Pastor, can you come over and anoint me? I've got cancer and I want to get rid of it. So I showed up at home to anoint her and the ashtrays were full. And I thought, oh, okay. I said, I can't anoint you for healing, but I will anoint you for victory over your habit of tobacco because you cannot be making choices that lead you down the wrong pathway and expect God to bless you and heal you from your choice that you make. Are you willing to exercise your choice to place restrictions on yourself so you might receive his blessings? That's part of the story we're studying today. Thirdly, do you know what God's purpose is for you? Are you keeping that in mind as you make the choices for your life in all things? The Bible says, I will praise him at all times. Psalms 34 verse 1. I will praise the Lord at all times. When we go through difficult times, when we go through times that may not be the way we like them. So I will end by reminding you of his warning. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with drowsing, drunkenness, cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare. On how many? I can't read it. All those who dwell on the face of the whole earth, that day is talking about the second coming. And I believe it's going to happen soon. Amen? We are told there will be some that say to the rocks and the mountains, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who will be able to stand? I believe those that are the exception to the rule that have made choices to say, I want you in my life, Lord. I want your guiding hand. I want you to be laying out the timing for my life so that I go in the right place at the right time and you can be blessed. Or it isn't because they didn't know or they weren't told, but because they got overwhelmed or distracted or busy with other priorities. Or they just plain failed to prepare. On that last day, Jesus did show up at that feast. The Bible says on that last great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out and said, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. God wants each one of us to be a fountain of life to others. The purpose he has called us for. You can reach individuals that I cannot reach. And vice versa. Each one of us has to be that witness to others. When we take upon that task and we turn the town upside down. Because we're telling others about the power of our God. And the possibility of being the exception to the rule. When we consider the choices that we have put upon ourselves and limit ourselves in our belief. He would not call you to accomplish a task that was impossible for you to do. Amen? Amen. Exception to the rule. Will you be added to this group when they write the final chapter? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also will not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. I've told the story before. When I was on a coast-to-coast -coast flight, one day, during the time I was doing evangelistic meetings, many times they would loan me to different conferences, and I was flying to the East Coast to do meetings in Maine. I sat next to this young lady, and I once the plane took off, it was a four or five hour flight, 
And I thought, well, I wonder if I can reach her. I wonder if she knows Jesus and where she's at in life. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try and reach her, Lord. And I was kind of talking to myself and just thinking through. And so I turned a little in my seat and I tried to strike up a conversation with her. And she made it very plain she wasn't interested. She thought I was hitting on her. And she, I was giving her the wrong idea by being friendly towards her. And so she kind of turned away towards the window. And as I talked a little more, she turned away more like, leave me alone, idiot. So I thought, oh, well, that's not working real well. And God says, yeah, it's not, is it? So I thought, Lord, what can I do? And as I thought about it, I thought about my Bible under my seat in my carry-on bag. And God said, read your Bible. And I said, okay. So I took my Bible out, and I read my Bible, and I was reading real hard. And I just focused on my Bible, and pretty soon she peeked over her shoulder, and she looked at me. And uh, so I thought, well, I've got to make sure she's really hooked, Lord. So I turned away a little bit. And she turned a little more, and she's looking over my shoulder, and I turned away like I'm hunched like this, reading my Bible like I'm trying to keep it from her. And finally, she can't stand it. She taps me on the shoulder. She says, could I talk to you? Oh, yeah, sure. And I turned around to talk to her. She said, is that a Bible you're reading? I said, yeah. She said, you know, I've, I just came from my mother's funeral, and I, I want to uh, talk to somebody about that. Could I talk to you about that? And I said, sure. This is what I was trying to find out from her. And she said, just before my mother died, my father went over to her and she whispered something to my father. And I think it was a Bible verse, but I don't know. And so she said, can you tell me what verse that was? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe she wants something theological. So I quoted from... Uh, John chapter 11, I read to her about Jesus being the life source of life, and she said, stop! Now, it was a four or five hour flight, and they sell these little bottles of alcohol, whiskey or whatever it was, and it seemed like every hour or two she was downing one of these things, and so she was getting a little louder and louder, and so when she hollered, stop, I'm sitting in the back of the plane next to her, and everybody turns around and looks at me, and I'm embarrassed. So I'm, I'm kind of leaning away from her like, I didn't touch her, really. So after everybody turns back away from me and looking at me, then she taps me on the shoulder. She says, no, I didn't mean you. I meant I don't like that verse. Can you read me another verse? Well, I kept wondering what verse to read to her. And I thought, well, what do I tell this woman? And so I was kind of searching for a verse in the Bible to read to her and kind of trying to figure out what to say, and uh, so I'm thinking in my mind, now what can I do this? And uh, so this verse came to me, and verse 8, Jeremiah 17, it says, For he shall be like a tree planted by the water, which spreads out its roots by the river. It will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green and not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. She said, I like that verse. Read it again. Okay, good. I found one she liked. And I said, uh, I read it again to her. And she, I said, can I read the verse before that? She said, yeah, go ahead. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. She hollers, stop. And I waited a minute. I said, can I read the verse after the verse you like? Oh, yeah, read that one. So I did. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? She said, oh, stop. All you ever do is talk about Jesus. She didn't want to hear about Jesus. I think there's a lot of people out there that want to hear about Jesus, that want you to share Jesus with them. And as they're going through difficult times, and as we think about Jesus' example here in making choices, and remembering the end game in mind that we're heading for heaven and what he has for us in mind to be a witness for him. If we want to be blessed and have that timing in our life where we're in the right place at the right time to be used by God, if you feel that way, I'd like you to stand with me right now. If you want to be blessed by God and say, I want God to guide me. I want the Holy Spirit to lead me. I want to be in the right place at the right time. Because I know God can do that for me. Our song in closing is Trust and Obey.
Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Father, we're thankful for Jesus' example in his life to give us strength and encouragement to let us know how to be among that group that are the exception to the rule. Lord, we want your spirit to guide us. We want to be in the right place at the right time. We want to surround ourselves with your encouragement, your strength, and your power. Bestow that upon us, Lord, that we might receive those blessings for which we desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.